Welcome back, I don't waste your time, let's get straight into it. One of my holdings today, Evolution Gaming, was down nearly 10% on the day. In today's video, we're going to look at exactly why that was, and on top of that, why I'm personally invested in this company, what the company does, and as always, we'll go over the qualitative aspects of it and the economic moat. So for starters, Evolution Gaming is a online casino live type company. Long story short, they don't actually own any of the gambling websites. Instead, all, all they do is they set up these tables, which are like the live games. You might have seen Drake or other popular celebrities where there's like a live game. There's a, a real person behind there that's moving all these cards, but you could join the games from the comfort of your home. Pretty much just blackjack or whatever other casino games, except um, it's it's online and you could just join into a game. It's virtual, all that type of stuff. Uh, in a minute, we're going to dive into why um, this is a significantly more advantageous business model compared to actually being the gambling websites. Um, but long story short, that's for the most part what they do. They do have other segments, uh, like they have the random number generator uh, or short form is RNG, which is like the slots and that type of stuff. But the main part of the business and the main profitable part of the business is the live games. Also, before we move on, I just wanted to mention, as always, you can go to my Twitter to view my real time um, portfolio. So as you can see, Evolution Gaming is a pretty sizable and meaningful position for me. So uh, not exactly happy that it sold off today, but I did get a chance to actually double my position. So Earlier today, it was only a 2% holding, and today I, I bought uh, a, a, another bunch of shares, and I have now doubled the position. So, why is Evolution Gaming down nearly 10% on the day? Long story short, they had this lawsuit that went down that I believe, I think it says it here, that it's, yeah, the deadline is in a couple days. But pretty much, um, what had happened is that there's some fake material or something like that it explains it here i'm not going to bother reading it but uh one of their customers or whatever might have misinterpreted some information or there was some false claim something like that and um they say that the class period is between these two dates so it applies to me at least <laughs> but uh yeah just one of their customers uh seems to have not been lawful didn't have a license some some sort of issue with that. I'm just going to quickly read this uh, paragraph that I found from a substack. I'll leave the description if you'd like to read this entire article with the author's name and everything. But uh, this is very central to my thesis. And uh, this is actually why I'm invested in Evolution Gaming and why I think they'll be successful. Long story short, Evolution Gaming benefits from massive scale economies in the sense that because they're the leader in their very, very niche um, industry, they get to continually reap the benefits of being the largest scale player. And it's just like a, a flywheel whereby they're the biggest player. So they'll continue to be the biggest player because they have the best access to the best games and um, the, the best gambling websites will come to buy from them. And it's, it's just a, a circle of it. it's like a self uh, fulfilling prophecy. So the author writes here, scale, scale, scale. Evolution Gaming is the dominant player within a good industry to be a leader in. This industry has a situation where if you can retain more users' attention, you make more money proportionately. He's not lying. Compare that to Netflix's business model, which can just hope to hold enough attention to prevent churn and increase prices further in iGaming. In iGaming, if the leader holds the user's attention, there's no automatic subscription that can help the 1% market shareholder. The competitor that simply goes out of business because they never got the player density required to even cover the operating expenses of, of each game. So what he's talking about here is with the tables of Evolution Gaming, um, you essentially, th there's like a fixed amount, there's a fixed cost to running those tables. So we could just, for simplicity's sake, say, I don't know, $100,000 per day, right, to run that table. If that table is able to, like because of the electricity, the rent of the, the warehouse they're sitting in, the paying the personnel and all, all the in-between, the equipment, the camera, the electricity, all that type of stuff, just overhead, right, operating expenses. So if that table is able to uh, create more than $100,000 of value and, and it's profitable, everything beyond that $100,000, which is essentially just a fixed cost, 
everything beyond that is pure margin. And when we go look at the financial metrics and the margins and that type of stuff, it'll all make sense. But beyond the $100,000, which is a fixed cost around that table, everything after that is just pure profit. And you'll see, you'll see when we go to look at the margins. But uh, he goes on to say with its scale, Evolution can spread its costs across its larger user base and then sing more per game and taking longer to get the game just right. This allows for better game flow, better security and more creative games. So that's what I mentioned earlier, right? Because they're the biggest scale player, they could invest the most into making their games the best. And naturally, if you're a gambling site, you're gonna want the best games for your website if, because you want your website to be successful. So you're gonna go to Evolution Gaming to get uh, their games compared to the next three competitors, whatever it may be. Charge more than competitors in revenue split. Since Evolution makes 10 to 12% commissions on revenue, even if a competitor comes in and offers 5 to 6%, then they would still need to make significantly more than Evolution per table for this to make a difference for the casino. If Evolution makes 25% more net revenue per table, then paying 5% more commission per table is worth it. This in turn allows Evolution to be more profitable and spend more on games. So it's not, th this can't be a race to the bottom because the games that Evolution runs are incredibly successful. The g uh, gambling websites or the casinos, they're always gonna wanna go with Evolution Gaming because their tables are just, it's just math. They're more profitable. So you would rather take, you would rather pay higher commissions for more dollar games because it's a more profitable table to begin with. Evolution can create more dedicated fixed fee tables for large customers. Evolution Gaming makes revenue from all its partners that have their own branded tables on its platform. This is a scale-based economy that pretty much only the large players can enjoy. Create its own lobby. You see after users enter Evolution's game, there is an exit to lobby button. That button doesn't take you back to the casino's interface though. That lobby is the Evolution. So th this, is, this is on their website. So on the Evolution Gaming website, it takes you to their specific games, um, which is a little bit different, but it's not exactly core to the thesis. Evolution is in a feedback loop. Yeah, okay, so this is, this is really important. Evolution is in a feedback loop where the industry leader continues to get stronger. It's a weird combination of business quality along with a complementary industry that rewards only the leader with excellent unit economics. So, and they, they gave us this visual here, and you can see that the gaming aggregators it's quite a co confusing chart, to be honest with you. But I think he's using this to say that the customers will just keep churning onto iGaming supplier. So that would be Evolution Gaming. I, I, I don't quite understand that. But anyways, uh, just kind of a random side note, by the way. Um, this is a great piece of analysis done by, by these guys. We study billionaires. Um, great, great podcast. I've, I've listened to it. They, they go over evolution gaming and the, the, this guy's quite knowledgeable. So yeah, good. Just good podcast to listen to. If you want to continue your, um, research on evolution gaming, I'll leave the link to in the description for that. Uh, this is a chart I found from this gentleman right here, G Nuffs. Um, but as you can see, so uh, like maybe some of you listening to the analysis over here, we're thinking, oh, okay, so they set up all these tables. I'm sure it's quite a capital intensive business to set up all these tables and maintain them and whatever. You would be wrong. So this is the operating cash flow of Evolution Gaming. Um, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to refer to this as dollars. It's almost one to one anyways, but they make nearly 1.2 billion uh, in operating cash flow. And in that operating cash flow, less than a hundred million of it is capital expenditure. So if you do the math on that, I think that's 8% of operating cash flow that goes to um, capital expenditures. And you could compare that to maybe some of the best software businesses in the world. I, I don't think it would be that far off. Um, I'm quite curious to know what the percentage for something like a Microsoft would be, but um, yeah, it's, it's not very capital intensive. They have had a history of making a lot of acquisitions before, but um, that's mostly died down after the 2021 mania. But as you can see, a business where capital expenditures is only 8% of operating cash flow, where does the rest of the cash flow go? Buybacks and dividends. So in recent years, they've uh, ramped up the buybacks and you could even go to FinChat to see those, um, to, to, to see the charts for that as well. But uh, they are a heavy dividend paying company. There's about, I think, 10% insider ownership. So 
Um, I, and, and it is a European company, so I guess they, they kind of do prefer their dividends over there. Um, be wary of uh, taxes, by the way, if you do invest in this company. I don't know how the tax structure, depending on your country or your state, would be like. Um, moving forward, we can see that th this is in Swedish kroners, but it's roughly a $20 billion company. 100% gross margins, something to note. That, uh, I think that is better than Visa's gross margins because Visa is something like 98, 99%. Um, so I found, I, found a, I found a business better than, than Visa. Um, operating margins, which uh, is quite an underrated uh, one between the margins, 63% standing strong. Free cash flow margin, almost the same. Uh, so uh, operating divided by free cash flow, they have nearly 100% uh, free cash flow conversion. And they have over 100% free cash flow conversion if you use net margins. Um, very interesting how uh, these two are very close, by the way, operating and net. I'd imagine just because they're a gambling company, there's a lot of taxes they'd have to pay, but I guess not. Um, Valuation-wise, incredibly cheap. They have zero in stock-based compensation. On FinChat, when you normally go down to the cash flow page, gives you an option for stock-based compensation. That option isn't here because they don't have any. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, not a demanding valuation at all. 20 times cash flow, which if you were to flip it, it would be just under 5% free cash flow yield. Uh, keep in mind, the S&P 500 is about three, three and a half percent free, free cash flow yield. Or if you were to flip it the other way, about 30 to 35 times free cash flow. So this company is significantly cheaper than the average S&P 500 company and it's expected to grow 13% earnings per share for the next two years and in the long term, so three to five years, about 18% free cash flow, or sorry, uh, earnings per share in the next five years. And if you look on trailing metrics, it, it does look a little bit ridiculous, especially on the longer time frames, like 60, 61% earnings per share average per year for 10 years, ridiculous. Um, but it's because they had a low starting base, and on top of that, COVID really accelerated um, that part of the business. Um, you would notice that uh, they have that much in cash, and their net debt is, I believe that means that they have $80 million in debt. I'm not sure why it doesn't just say the, yeah, because EBIT divided by interest. So their interest coverage, not there. So I guess they just don't have any debt. Um, weird. Um, this dividend yield is also inaccurate. Uh, I think FinChat is measuring it incorrectly. In dollar terms, um, yeah, like you can see right here. That, that's in euros, I believe. I don't know what that is. That might be Swedish kroner. But um, yeah, so th this this yield is incorrect. It's closer to 1.5%, 2%, if I remember correctly. Um and I was going to just quickly pull up the, okay, I got it now. So I was going to pull up the free cash flow uh, pr or price to free cash flow of this company. You can see that since their IPO in 2014, we are currently trading, well, uh, I guess in October 20, 2023, just a couple of months ago, we were trading at the all-time low valuation, but we are below like literally the entire history of this company, except maybe here. Um, it's almost at the all-time low valuation of the company ever. Now, th that would be alarming for some, um, but it's just simply that they're not growing at 50-60% anymore. And there is a little bit of uh, risk, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm not saying anyone should invest in, in this company just based off this video, but you should always do your own due diligence. Um, the valuation is cheaper than it's ever been in its history. So just something to consider. Uh, I'm gonna just quickly get the margin story out of the way as well. As you could see since their IPO again, you can see operating and net margins were in, or sorry, free cash flow and operating margins were in the mid to high 20% range. And over time they've climbed to 60%. It looks nearly the same if you were to look at net margins as well. Net margins are also coasting. Interesting how free cash flow trailed the blue one trailed purple for a while, but now it's above. But yeah, you see net profit margins are 60%. That's after they pay taxes, um, which is just incredible. And yeah, just a great company, very efficient company.
capital light. Um, they, they should continue buybacks and dividends out into the future. And something to have on your radar, especially given the sell-off. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.